Good. All right. Everybody, welcome back from lunch. Um, we're going to get started here in just a few seconds. But um, before we get started, let's give a big round of applause to everybody that's volunteering today, speaking today. This stuff doesn't happen without these people. So thank you to everybody in B-Sides. All right, so today we're going to talk about taking a company from a pretty big breach to kind of a, you know, getting to a security organization, at least a foundational level. So quick question before we go. How many of you here work for a large corporation with a pretty mature security organization where you have separate incident responders, you have separate penetration testers? Okay, a few, few, good, good. How many of you work for small businesses where if it hits the fan, you're staying up late night and it's on you to recover? There we go, those are my people. <laughs> Just a bit of housekeeping. Um, this is a series of talks that I have. All my talks are up on the slide share. Um, Twitter handle is rye underscore whiz. It'll be up on the uh, slides later. But all my talks are public. Feel free to take pictures, record, take notes, whatever you want. But um, know that we're going to fly through these slides. I got like 70 slides to go through. But um, all the slides are posted. So if you miss something, feel free to go steal them. So as I talk through, this is a kind of an amalgamation of a few different uh, incidents that I was part of. They are all basically the same story. So I just want to, some of the statements I'm going to make are pretty outlandish, um, but these are true scenarios. They are real life. They're not exaggerations. So these are companies, you know, small businesses where they have underfunded IT and basically non-existent security. So these are your schools, your non-for-profits, your charities, your churches, right? Your mom and pops down the road. Um, these things actually happen. So since I've given this talk, um, there's been a couple of updates. So not pet, yeah, it was, what was that, June 2017, about? The White House has estimated more than $10 billion of uh, United States impact. Um, NotPetya was the attack from supposedly the Russians against the Ukraine um, critical infrastructure, but there was a lot of uh, collateral damage on this attack. Um, Maersk, the large shipping company that ships big containers across seas, they were they have a couple publications out there on how it impacted them. Mondelez, the um, Oreos, everybody knows Oreos. They were impacted by this as well. Um, there's some lawsuits going on with those guys, but um, it's, it's a big deal. And just recently, if you follow the Twitters, uh, this company VF Email, small email provider, uh, very transparent apparently on their security posture. He's live tweeting an attack that he found. And, um, essentially the attacker was just writing zeros over anything they could find, including their backups. Um, I haven't followed up on VF email anymore, but I know that they did lose all their data. So if you were using these email providers, they had nothing. And this poor guy um, couldn't recover. So these are real life situations. We're gonna take a hypothetical here. We all know what hypothetical means in our industry. We're under NDA, right? So <laughs> let's take a hypothetical. All right, you just started at this organization. Um, Trying to, you know, you you know where the bathroom is in the office. You know that you're running Windows at least. So, you get a strange message sent to your um, phone. You know, hey, can you take a look? Everybody's complaining that nothing's working. So you log on to the server. You see something like this. Maybe you see something like this. Heaven forbid, you see this one. Or. We're under attack. Uh. Do you want to kill the speakers? Otherwise, I can talk loud, and you can get on the recorder still. Yeah, no, we're off. Yeah. Just kill the speakers. I can talk loud and right into the mic so you can record still. Yeah. This works. Cool. 
yeah, so this is WannaCry. That's a bad one. Um, in the case of VF email, maybe they were seeing something like this. I don't know what exactly your disaster is going to be, but there's going to be a point that you're going to have some type of disaster that you're faced with. And oftentimes, these companies, um, you start incident response, no problem. So you come in, you're like, where's your incident response plans? <laughs> well, we know it's important to do. Uh, we just, uh, we got this huge exchange migration going on and we just haven't got around to it. Okay, fine, F forget incident response, we gotta get this company back up. Where's your disaster recovery plans? Well, yeah, <laughs> about five years ago, uh, this guy named Jim, he ran DR plans all the time, he, he told us it was great. Okay, cool, where's Jim? Uh, he retired four years ago. All right, do you have any system doc? Does anybody know how this is built? Well, yeah, remember Jim? <sighs> so, here we go. So this is building incident response while in an incident. Step zero is to remember to breathe. So I stole two quotes from our armed forces. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. You don't have time to screw up right now. Does anybody know how long their business can operate without technology? Seconds. Anybody else? Higher? 24 hours. 24 hours? Okay. Lunch. Lunch. <laughs> right? So a lot of times it's the answer is we don't know, we can't, or two weeks because that's when people get paid. All right? So second quote here, embrace the suck. This is going to be terrible. This is probably going to be one of the worst points in your life. People are dependent on you. If you don't come through, most likely the company's going bankrupt and people are going to be out of jobs. So you're literally going to be paying people's mortgage. It's going to be terrible, but then you can come talk at B-Sides afterwards. <laughs> First thing that you do is engage a legal counsel. If you have a general counsel, great. If you have a lawyer on staff, great. Otherwise, call a lawyer. You're going to want them to engage your incident responders. Because, again, we're a small business. We got hit because probably we had a 2003 box up there. We don't have an incident response team. We want legal to engage the incident response because there's a special legal privilege where things can maybe not be discoverable in court if they find other things. Now, if your legal team doesn't engage this, everything that the incident responders find can be um, discoverable in court, might uncover things that you don't want to be uncovered. So always engage legal first. All right, now it's time for us to work. It's bad, we know it's bad. We need to stabilize this patient before it dies though. So we gotta ask three questions. What do we know? How do we stop it from getting worse? And how do we make sure that we don't make it worse? There's nothing worse than you think you're doing a recovery and you accidentally format all your drives. So what do we know? This is the most general IT diagram that can describe 90% of companies out there. You're gonna have legacy windows because you can't figure out how to move this one application off this Windows 2003 box. You're gonna have a whole bunch of clients because that's what people do. You're gonna have a cloud because that's really cool and that's where everything's going. But you still haven't figured out how to move everything up there so you're kind of segregated. And then you're gonna have this old machine with some dust on it called a mainframe or an AS400 or a power system. This is running your ERP because IBM has you and you can't figure out how to get off of them. So. It is. <laughs> what are they at, nine nines now? <laughs> there, I'm gonna talk to you later. There's an uh, ex-IBMer, so. <laughs> but, um, so that's normal. What do we see now, though? That's the question that we have to answer, right? So let's say we got hit by WannaCry or something doing SMB1 because we're terrible people and we had SMB um, out to the world, easy, RDP, I don't care what the attack factor is. Somehow they got in and they started replicating everywhere. All of our Windows systems are hosed, right? They are locked up, they're ransomware, they're formatted somehow, some way. We're starting to see clients exhibiting the same behavior. As people boot up, five to 10 minutes in, all of a sudden they get a blank screen. You stand up in your cubes and you can actually see the cascading failures coming through at 8, 8.05, whenever people are showing up. So as long as people haven't powered on, they're unaffected. But once they powered on, they're affected. Cloud looks OK. IBM stuff looks OK. But we see some C2 traffic going from both the server networks and the client networks. And we see the malicious traffic going between the clients and servers. So what do we want to do? How do we stop this from getting worse? This is interactive part. It's after lunch, I don't want people sleeping. 
Unplug the switch. <laughs> next, next. Communication to clients. It's, seriously, if communication is huge here. How do you communicate to your people, though? No technology? Backbone? Exactly. So oftentimes, your incident response will be send an email out to everybody saying, don't power on your systems. <laughs> it's not going to work, All right? Use your Cisco um, call center to do this. That's not going to work, right? OK, so what else are we doing? Out of band communications, excellent. Don't, <sighs> so again, you're in an incident. Don't send confidential information across your compromised email system. Hey, what was that? Backups. Go find your backups. Yes. What if your backups are infected? Yeah. Offsite backups. <laughs> what if we haven't read them in seven years and they're on actual tape? <laughs> Call Jim if you can find Jim. Yes. Anything else? Anyone? All right. So, yeah, I think we hit most of them. We can disconnect the internet, right? We got C2 going back and forth that's commanding this stuff. Let's disconnect it, see what happens. We somehow have a compromised user. We don't know what user it is yet, but this thing is propagating across. Chances are it's got a user account or a DA account. Should we disable everybody? <laughs> it's Jim. <laughs> right? Do we just power down everything? I bet you I can stop the malware infection if I just pull the plug on the data center. Exactly. So the next step that we're going to do, thank you for the segue. We're going to list out the bad things that could happen, right? So if I just go and unplug the data center, you just lost all your memory forensics, all right? What if I corrupt transactions, right? Chances are I got this legacy system on IBM running DB2, but we wanted to write applications in .NET, so we got a SQL database on the other side. They're replicating back and forth. If I pull the plug on one, am I going to have corrupt transactions on the other? When's the last time you tested your DB2 rollbacks? Probably Jim, right? So what if we disconnect the internet and block the C2? Is there a kill switch in the malware that's just going to start wiping everything? So it started with a ransomware. They wanted 300 bucks. Now they just wiped everything because you killed their C2. All right, so we have to kind of think through these pretty quickly because, again, business is down. But we got to think through these, make sure that we're not going to impact it any worse. Then we're going to execute, right? So. This is usually what happens. Um, we're going to disable routing. Okay? Things can't spread if they have nowhere to spread to. We're going to disable all domain accounts. This, this is rough. Nobody's going to be able to work. But we don't know what's compromised yet. We know something's compromised. Disable them. Be safe. Okay? Now that nobody can work, send people home. You're going to have to do a little bit of PR work here, too, because the rumor mill is going to spread quickly. can't tell you how many people is like, oh, that one guy that came in the office two weeks ago, he looked Russian. Do you think it was him? Like, guys, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> it, it's it's going to get ugly. Uh, make sure that you send people home. A lot of people are going to want to help. They're coming from a good place, but they're just not going to be helpful. If they were helpful, they would have patched that system. But um, <laughs> then... You're going to have to figure out which senior leaders to involve in this because you're going to need them to figure out business continuity planning. They're going to know how to keep your business running at least for the time that you need. Okay? So we do this. Here we go. We got the business down, right? No systems are communicating anywhere. But we do have the systems up and running, so we do have a little bit of a place for forensics. We do have a place for recovery because we have to figure out how to rebuild all this. So. Now that we know where we're at, we have to kind of come up with what we're going to do now. So here's some more questions you can ask yourself. What's broken? How bad is it? What do we need to fix and what do we need to do first? OK, so what's broken? Be careful with this. I've screwed this up before. Don't ask what's broken. It makes sense to us because we need to know what's broken so we can fix it. But when you ask what's broken, this is the answer you get. Huh? I actually have a live feed from when I asked um, the C-level suites uh, about this. This is what they look like, right? <laughs> I, it's, so rephrase this, OK? What do we need to do to stay in business? This gives them something to work on, right? So 
when you're talking to the board, when you're talking to the C-level, this is going to sound really terrible, but they're very good at very little. They know exactly how to make money using your company, and they know how to manage risk, okay? Give them questions that they can use so they can help you, okay? So what do we need to do to stay in business? They're going to come back to you with something that probably looks like this. This is a basic business cycle. There's going to be customers that want us to do something. We're going to do something. They're going to pay us, and then we're going to pay whoever we have to pay, All right? So if you're in manufacturing, you're going to take orders. You're going to make a product. You're going to ship the product. You're going to pay your suppliers. You're going to receive payment for your goods. All right? So chances are 90% of the businesses are going to look like this. Changes if you're Facebook, but Facebook has Facebook problems, right? So next question is, how do we do these things? Cool. We need, we need to know how to do this. This is where our skills come into play, okay? We have to find information. We are on a black box pen test. We are red teamers at this point. We need to figure out exactly how these systems used to work. We still have the systems up and running. Take everything with a grain of salt because you don't know what's good, what's not. We're going to go through absolutely everything we find. Anybody work in a data center with a raised floor? Yep, yep, okay. So, suction cups. Pop off your floor tiles. No joke, I found a DR binder underneath a floor tile once. It's good stuff, right? So, we're going to absolutely anything that we can find, okay? We're going to start making a whiteboard. Sticky notes, I don't care what you're using. Organize your thoughts, okay? So it's going to start to kind of make sense to you, but this is what it's going to look like to other people, okay? <laughs> so once you have it straight in your head, get it down in Excel. Here's a pro tip for everybody. If you want to get something done in business, put it in Excel, magically it gets done, okay? We're going to create this matrix that has our critical functions for like take orders, send products, whatever we're doing. We're going to have our system names that are supporting these functions. And then we're going to have what step in the recovery that they're at. Okay? Color coded. Management loves colors. They understand colors. Red is bad. Green is good. <laughs> Put this up on a projector, on a TV screen, somewhere where people can go and not bother you for status. The last thing that you want is every 15 minutes somebody coming in and asking how it's going. You have to work. Okay? They're in a bad situation. That's fine. Give them the information they need. Keep them out of your hair so you can work. So, again, going back to step zero, and we can't screw this up. How do we do this safely? What if we restore the malware? That'd be bad. What if we reintroduce the malware because we're careless? That'd also be bad, right? So, we're going to restore the systems into this quarantine zone. And then we're going to move them to the network. There's one problem with this diagram, though. Notice the backup systems are running Windows. They are also impacted. So if you have online backups, chances are those are also gone. So <laughs> we go back to our real tapes. We go back to anything that is off-site, offline. Okay? Does anybody here still use real tape? Cool, cool. Who has offline DASD or storage? Okay. Who only has online backups? If you have only online backups, chances are you're not going to survive a ransomware attack or some other type where they're just wiping disks. Okay? Think about that strong and hard and how you're going to recover if they wipe everything. So if we still have real tapes or offline, we're going to rebuild our backup catalog. I don't care if you're using Commvault, Symantec, whoever backups. If you can provide them all the raw disk, they can be able to rebuild your backup catalogs onto a new system. So that's how we're going to restore. This quarantine zone, it is out of band and air gapped. And when I mean air gapped, I mean literally air gapped. It is in a cabinet that has no network connectivity anywhere. If it's a virtual machine, you have a new access host, you're putting them on there and you're checking them out. If it's a pizza box, you're physically moving them into this rack. Make sure that these are air gapped. Okay? Because most likely, this attacker has been in your network for a while. Although he hit the wiper, maybe he was in there six months ago, maybe a year ago. And you're going to restore some type of backdoor that he's planted on his day zero Im, um, implementation. You're going to monitor the crap out of these things for any indicators of tax or compromise. Okay? After you've deemed these things clear, you're going to either copy them to a brand new formatted hard disk and move them in your production, or you're going to physically move them, or then we're going to move them to the new network. Okay? So this new network, what do we want in the new network? This is our time to go implement security without change control. Nobody cares if you impact it because they're down. So what do we want in this new network? 
Again, interactive, interactive. <laughs> Everything. Okay, cool. What are we starting with? <laughs> we have nothing, right? We have absolutely nothing. We're going to be moving systems in. How do we want to instrument our new security? All right, we want to make sure security. So checklists, right? Make sure you have all your agents on there, your antivirus and all that stuff. What else? Segment your network, excellent. What else we got? This is your chance. Security protocols, what do you mean? Firewalls, yes, we want firewalls, yes. <laughs> patch, 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 patch some more, yes. Get rid of your Windows 2003 servers. <laughs> Rebuild them. This is your chance to move that application you could not move for sending stuff. Don't care. Get rid of your legacy apps. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't restore them. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to figure out another way to calculate postage now. So. <laughs> So the question is, online backups. The drives aren't mapped. How are the attackers going to find them? UNC pass, yes. Um, any red teamers here? This is usually a full blue team. All right, red teamer. How do you find a system that isn't mapped to another system? Yeah. Right, I got a file server that's not mapped to anything. How are you going to find that file server on the network? Okay, ARPNET discover, run an nmap, run a ping sweep. I don't care how you find it. If the system's online, your red team's going to find it, right? From there, it just becomes a, play, a playground. It's like, hmm, wonder what this system's doing. Cool. It's running Windows 2012, and it's still vulnerable to Blue Eternal. Pop. All of a sudden, they got all your data. So although that your clients can't see the data, I can see the data. It's online, right? So that's kind of how they can find it. So they're just going to kind of traverse your network. They're going to laterally move. They're going to pop whatever they can. We already said that they have domain admin. So they can see anything and everything on your network. So. All right. Man, you guys are no fun. What, what wish list items do you got? All right, we'll cheat. All right, so network segmentation. We hit that one. We need a new domain. Our domain got popped. We have no idea what's good, what's bad, what's indifferent. Start building from scratch. Go find an employee roster from HR. Start building from there. It's going to be terrible. But this is, like I said, you can't risk a reinfection at this point. Nobody mentioned Splunk, Security Onion, logging, Sims. We need to be instrumented because we just kicked the, uh, the attacker out of his playground. Pam! <laughs> Privilege accounts management for anybody that didn't hear that one. Um, yeah, if, if we're trying to protect domain admin access, Protect them. Don't just have them, right? Oh, I'm a domain admin. I log into my email and my internet here too. No, don't let them do that. So get a sim because we just kicked the attacker out of his playground. Anybody here have kids? <laughs> if you take away a ball from a kid, what is the only thing the kid now wants? He wants his ball back. We just took the ball away from the attacker. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to come back in. Oh, I keep saying he. It could also be a female attacker. They're, females are just as good. But um, application aware firewalls. Right? Um, I worked an incident. There were no records of exfiltration until we started looking at DNS. There was gigabyte DNS requests leaving. Well, they weren't DNS, everybody. Make sure that you can inspect your traffic and understand what's going on. All right. Incident response toolkit, we didn't hit on that one. If the attacker comes back, how are we going to do this better next time? All right. There's a good tool out there, GUR, Google Rapid Response. It's basically a rootkit that you can install on anything and everything. You can remotely capture memory then. You can see what processes are running. So this is going to really enable you to catch something in the event before they can do something. Multi-factor auth, you probably got popped because somebody was using, oh, what are we in now, summer 2019 or spring 2019, all right? Multi-factor auth anywhere that on your perimeter and then start working inside. Patch, 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 patch. 
Get a vulnerability scanner in there. We patched. It's cool. It's not going to maybe see the Java vulnerabilities that we have. All right. Um, Equifax, struts. It's always Java. <laughs> All right. Struts. It, it, it patch this stuff, right? On our perimeter, get some email protection in there. Maybe you got phished. That's how they got initial. Not sure. Get a proxy out there. Send everybody through a proxy. It's going to protect a lot of stuff. Right? Now, this is difficult because we're doing this in the middle of the restore. We're doing this because we need to. It's probably 100, 150 hours and no sleep at this point. You need to define a point of being done. As we can do this till the cows come home, but you can't forget that you have a business to run. So when are you done? Can you perform your critical functions? Can the business operate? You're not going to have the efficiencies that you used to have, but at least can it function? How much longer can you keep the business down? Been in cases where you got the executive board saying, we go bankrupt at midnight of this day. We have eight hours left. We need to turn the systems on. Then how much can you do without sleep? Sleep deprivation is a real thing. If anybody wants to get junk on the cheap, don't sleep. You're going to start seeing things. And at this point, at least the business is running. We can go take a nap. So I got miscellaneous tips up here just from being in these war rooms all the time. Try to remember the three, two, one rule of cons. Okay? Try to get three hours of sleep. You're not going to in the initial. It, you're going to go three, four days without sleep. But once you get the initial backups kicked off and they're restoring, take a nap in the data center. It's nice and cool in there. And, and yeah, try to figure out how to shower. The war room's going to smell. Just, just shower. Okay? Um, this is really key. Assign a war room manager. This is going to be a person that's in charge of all the food. Feed your troops. You got to keep people happy. They're also going to be in charge of getting any supplies. Have them go and buy all the USB drives that you, they can find. Okay? They're going to schedule the meetings. They're going to have the conference lines open. They're going to be liaisoning between um, law enforcement and your legal counsel. Critical resource to have. Save absolutely everything. You don't know what's going to be used for or against you. Make sure you save everything. USB drives are cheap. Go buy them all. And then ensure out of band communication. Um, yeah, don't send your new DA creds over the compromised email system, please. Okay. The comments, but it's encrypted, but you just sent the keys also. But um, so, so lesson two, building a security organization. So I never want to do that again. That was, that was awful. So how do we prevent this? Take a little bit of a proactive approach. So we kind of think about where are we weak? And, then kind of how do we prioritize? There's going to be a lot of work, right? Because we just saw where we're weak. The answer is everywhere, right? So you're going to start thinking about this. You're going to do a little bit of a gap analysis. We know where we're at, right? We're in our infancy. We're still in diapers. We want to become this Olympic athlete. So our job is really to define how do we get there. So the Olympic athlete, where do we want to be? Go steal somebody else's framework. These people get paid to do this. They're a lot better than us. They've done it already. Go steal either NIST, GDPR, CIS, OWASP, your favorite framework. Go steal it and modify it for your organization. If you want, I have one out on my website as well. It's nice and pretty for management. It's color-coded. It's not, it, You can take little circles. It's written in English. Anybody here read 853 from NIST? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so this is summarized off of 853 and written into plain English so you can kind of give your directors, your management, your C-levels exactly what you're trying to do and then kind of explain out why you need all this money. So you're going to have these different cards on this. So my example, it's an easy one. Physical assets are inventoried, right? You're going to give you a score between 1 and 5 on how good you are. And then we're just going to kind of talk through how do we do that. Okay, so the one to throw out five. I got any CISSPs in here? Capability, maturity models. Yeah, this is the boring stuff. So um, how do we rate ourselves based on what we are, right? So you start from one. One is an ad hoc process. So for our example in physical security or a physical asset inventory, Ryan goes and buys something. I go put it in, I have somewhere on a spreadsheet or maybe I write down, here's the serial numbers and our support process, right? That's an ad hoc process, I can do it. I probably can explain it to somebody else, but they're not gonna do it the exact same way. 
Number two, it's a repeatable process, right? So I have a checklist now. I have a process document. I have something that I can hand to another person, and now they're going to get the same results that I do. Number three is defined. So this is taking that process document and actually making a process out of it. So now we have a purchase order that's assigned to a barcode scan, that's assigned to a production change control, that's assigned to some type of support date contract. And you know, so you start building up this maturity level. So instead of me going to Best Buy buying a server, now we have a purchasing department that buys and procures, then we have an operations team that puts in. So it's this tracking, right? So if we go to four, this is now a managed process and we're gonna notice this exceptions. So in our change control process, um, we see that an asset number has not been assigned. We don't approve the change, it doesn't go live. You know, so this is actually a managed process. Now we notice exceptions. Five is continually improving. So this is, we're getting better and better and better every single time we do it. I don't have a good example for this for physical assets, but remember, not everything has to be a five. And if you get everything to a five, you're probably spending your resources uh, irresponsibly. Every dollar that we take from the business is the dollar that they can't use to make more money, right? So we're, as much as we like it, we're a cost center, right? We're a necessary cost center, but we're still a cost center. We have to make sure that we're using our resources wisely. So don't put everything in a five, but figure out what you need for your organization. Huh? So we decide we want a three. We want a defined process for physical assets. So how do we get there? So. So we're going to spin up an asset management program. All right, we're going to make a system that's going to follow our procurement. Here's our requirements. Once this is implemented, we know that we took the process from a one to a three. We can show management what we did. Everybody's happy. They applaud. And then what happens is you start getting all these project ideas. And you can organize these project ideas into these different areas, right? You're going to have an asset management project. You're going to have vulnerability management. You're going to have DR. You're going to have everything else up here. It's a lot of work. What do we do first, right? We have a small team if we're not one person. Oh, we threat model this, right? So this is going to define our priorities. So we make these a whole bunch of diagrams. We do an attack matrix. We do a surface, a tree. We're going to define all this stuff. We're going to look at the geopolitical relationships between the Middle East and America. And yeah, <laughs> no, we're not there yet. We're going to keep this simple. Threats are the bad guys. Protection is what we just put in. Assets are what we're protecting. We're going to draw a pretty graph. So this is based on loss expectancy. If we know that a catastrophic event is going to cost our business $10 million, and it's going to happen once every 10 years, let's say, we can actually get to a uh, loss expectancy number. This is kind of used in the insurance business. but. Let's say you have a 50% chance of losing $5. Your actual loss expectancy is 250. So what we do is we multiply out and we see what our highest risks are. All right, so what happens is the top right, these are the things that are probably going to happen and they're going to be big impacts when they do. So these are things that you got to take care of. Bottom left, there are things that aren't going to cost you much money and they're probably not going to happen. Don't worry about those for now. The other two quadrants are a little bit trickier to do, so I kind of adapted this and called it bang for buck. So we're going to take that loss expectancy number and we're going to graph it against how easy it is to mitigate. Now all of a sudden, we get a little bit different. So top right is going to be things that are high, um, high probability, high impact, but they're very easy to do. We want to do those first. Anybody use LAPS? Local admin password solution. If you're not using it, go Google it, get it done. Okay, so what it does is you got a client, he's got a local admin on there, right? Chances are, I'm not going to assume anybody out there, but chances are that local admin is the same across all your computers. One client gets compromised, they have local admin across your fleet. Don't let them do that. Install LAPS. It's a GPO push, it's real simple put it in about two hours, including testing. What it's going to do is you push out from your domain controllers, the clients are going to talk back, and they're going to rotate passwords automatically for you. There's a little GUI client that you can give your help desk. You type in the computer name, it spits out the password, you press the reset button, now it's rotated. Really simple to do. It's going to get 90% of your you know, local traversals. 
LAPS, L-A-P-S, Local Admin Password Solution, free from Microsoft. Okay. So now that we kind of know the work that we're going to do, we know what order we're going to do it. Let's just go do it. So we bring this in front of our management. They give us a whole bunch of money because we're really good at talking to them now. We know how to explain what we need. We can show them our progress on our maturity models. They're going to give us money. And then they're going to ask, how are you spending this money, right? You got to set up some type of governance, set up quarterly meetings, however you want to do it. And then just kind of track progress, keep doing your risk analysis, and congratulations, you're accidentally a CISO. Uh, yay! <laughs> so at this point, um, this talk is a kind of high level. It's not technical. Uh, I like to leave this part really Q&A with everybody so we can cover anything and everything you guys want. So thank you for coming after lunch and not falling asleep on me. So any questions at this time? Yes? What does IOAs and IOC stand for? Indicators of attack and indicators of compromise. So these are going to be malicious PCAPs. They're going to be some type of snort alerts. They're going to be um, antivirus alerts, right? So it's anything that is going to indicate that there's an attacker or an adversary on your system. How do, we, how do we justify a budget when we don't have any money to spend now? Um, <laughs> update your resume. Um, so it's going to be a really interesting phenomenon that what happens after you have a major breach. You're going to have a blank check for a very short amount of time. They're going to be saying, what do you want? Go get it now. And that runs out in about a month. So my best advice for how to get budget and kind of keep this thing going Show them results, right? So you got to get into the mind of a business person, right? If you want to talk about social engineering, what motivates a business person? It's all money. So how do we show that our security program is actually making us money? Anybody know? Yep. Excellent. So justify the breach that you just had. How much did that cost the business, right? Let's say that we were down a week and we know it cost us 18 million in operating expense. And I have a plan that you're gonna give me $3 million and we can prevent that now. So you're gonna spend 3 million to prevent an $18 million loss. That's a $15 million gain, right? That, start, that conversation kind of starts and they start understanding what we're talking about. So quick tangent. Um, so I'm from Chicago, anybody from Chicago? All right. Um, you know when you're walking down the street and you get these alley vendors, they're selling you little knickknacks and everything? Welcome past the guy, and he's got these little wooden um, elephant. It's kind of got a hole in the mouth and stuff. And I'm like, eh, that kind of looks cool. I'll get it for kids. How much? He's like, eh, it's $18,000. I'm like, okay. $18,000 for this little thing? He goes, no, 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 you don't understand. This is an elephant whistle. Like, okay, I'll bite. Well, what's an elephant whistle? He goes, every day. I wake up and I blow the whistle. It keeps the elephants away. <laughs> All right. So, okay, $18,000, that's a good price. It's keeping all the elephants out of Chicago. Dude, no, like, how do I know it works? He goes, well, you see any elephants? <laughs> okay, so that's kind of what we do in security, right? We go to the board and say, hey, we need this new IDS you know, thing with this blinky box. Okay, why do you need this new appliance? Because you just spent $6 million on all these firewalls that you told me I was going to prevent it. Well, yeah, 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 but we don't protect everything. We need this other thing to alert when we are actually breached. Oh, okay, so you spent all these millions of dollars to prevent a breach, but now you need another thing to detect the breach. Right? We're selling elephant whistles at that point. We don't want to do that. We need to be able to really precisely describe what we're doing. All right, so if we go back to that framework, I had it broken down to um, protect, um, protect, effect, whatever the frameworks are, right? Respond, recover. And you can kind of pick and choose exactly where you want to put emphasis and explain why, right? So in my opinion, detection is more important than protection. Protections can always be breached. All right, um, house owners, everybody, 
live in a house at least, even if you live on the streets in a cardboard box, this applies. So if somebody wants to come and break in, how easy is it to break into your house? Right? Everybody has a window, a door, a little flap on your cardboard box. It's easy to break in. But you know what? I'm not letting them leave. I know where the squeaky boards are. I'm going to hear him in the house. I know where he's going, right? He's going for the crown jewels. Protect that stuff. Make sure they can't leave. I'm okay with you breaking into my house, but you're not going to steal anything from me. Same thing with security, right? So that's cool. I mean, antivirus. Do, do I have anybody that's going to profoundly defend antivirus is a silver bullet to everything. Cool. <laughs> right? But antivirus does serve a purpose. Because what if you get breached and you say that you don't have antivirus? Good luck spinning that in the PR, right? It's, it's like taking vitamins. Do vitamins actually help us now? I mean, we got good food, but it's not going to hurt. Take the one a day, right? So <laughs> I have no idea where that question goes, but <laughs> please, one a day, sponsored. Um, <laughs> where did that question even start? <laughs> we told did, Oh, there we go. Yeah, uh, take a one a day vitamin. <laughs> so uh, how to fund. Empirical evidence. That's going to be what you want to do. You want to show that you have 4,000 vulnerabilities. You have a vulnerability management program that's going to decrease your burn down rate through 10% a week. We're going to burn down in three months, and then we can do the whole thing again because vulnerabilities keep popping up. But um, business people like data. Don't sell them elephant whistles. That's where we can. And Take your vitamins, everybody. V8. <laughs> Questions? Any other thing? We got plenty of time. Yep. So in this situation, do I care where the breach started? Yes and no. So this is going to depend on your situation. You got cyber insurance? Yes. I will lead a huge debate if we want to split up. Cyber insurance is great on this side. Cyber insurance is terrible on this side. And we can do this for the next three hours. Um, it's going to depend, right? So I went back to school, got an MBA, I learned one thing. The answer is always, it depends. So there you go, everybody's got an MBA now. So. Exactly, so uh, Mondelez right now, I mentioned Mondelez, not Petya. They came out and said, we had this terrible, unfortunate event. There was this crazy nation state that came and attacked us. We suffered all this breach, right? And then they contacted their cyber insurance vendor and they said, well, that's, Great and all, but if you read your policy, we don't cover acts of war. You came out blatantly and said you have attribution. This is an act of war. We don't cover that as insurance company. Sorry. So attribution is a very sticky topic. Do you need to attribute your breach? If you're a small company, 200, 300 employees, you make widgets. Do you care who breached you or do you care that you got breached? So, and... Then we have to talk about prioritization of spending too. Attribution is expensive. Do we want to spend that money right now when we're down in the one level of maturity? Or is that coming when we're at the fours or the fives, right? Now, if I'm a huge financial institution, I process credit cards. I probably care at that point, but I'm spending a lot more, right? Because that's a critical access to my uh, competitive advantage, right? So it depends. If we want to split up, attribution is important on this side. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm in the camp, so I have a business-focused mind. If I attribute the attacker to something, is that going to give me any value add back to the business? Chances are no. It depends. Exactly. <laughs> I, I will get you your degree soon, sir. <laughs> but if I'm working for counterintelligence agencies, might might matter, right? So... Depends. Well, so I don't want to 
Excellent. So the comment is, if you were breached, do you care how you were breached? 100%, yes. TTPs, tactics, techniques, procedures, right? They're hard to do, but if we're in this situation that I'm talking about, chances are the TTPs was, oh, Metasploit, cool. I'm going to look for MS 1710 or MS 0867, right? I'm going to look for these little things because these are mom and pop shops. They don't patch their systems. They don't even know they have the systems out there. So yeah, we got breached by 0867. I need to patch. That's what I'm learning, right? So that goes into the lessons learned project, um, you know, where you kind of dig through the rubble and figure out exactly what it is. Chances are, in these types of situations, it's going to be pretty easy to find out what happened. You know, you got a skiddy kind of just going out there. Ooh, OSCP, what is that teaching me? And they find something in breach, right? Um, if it's a little bit more advanced, you're going to have to spend more money, right? This comes down to the economics of warfare, right? So. It's funny because the criminal activity is very well funded. And has anybody ever had to call a ransomware vendor? They have better help desks than most of our cell phone providers. Um, they they got a good ticketing system because all this stuff is making them money. They want to be efficient as well. What we need to do is make it so that it's inefficient, right? So or make something else more efficient. Anybody notice ransomware has kind of fell off, and crypto mining kind of took off. It's cheaper and easier for them to make their money crypto mining instead of ransomware. Ransomware is harder and harder as more and more people aren't paying the ransoms. They're getting better at attacking. Most people aren't reacting to crypto miners. What's another 10% of my CPU? That's okay. Uh, there was a story out there that the crypto miners were actually patching systems to keep other adversaries out. And they just took it. Like, great, this is a cheap outsource, right? So, <laughs> yes, TTP is very important. Anything else? Got a couple more minutes. Yep. Okay, um, so the question is, how do we get management to define a good point of being done? So, Let's say that we had a 1,000 servers, and all of them are infected. We can't possibly recover all 1,000 servers at the same time. we got to prioritize, and we also need to sleep because we're not superhumans. So the way I do it is we're going to get the business back up and running, and we're going to take a break. And then we're going to see. We're just going to sit and wait. Chances are the attacker's coming back for its ball. All right? At this point, we're well instrumented, and we kind of know what's going on now. We know how he came in. We're going to watch him. We got law enforcement involved now. We got the incident responders. We got our legal team. We're much more better prepared than where we were before. Let's wait and see what happens. Business, we understand you're not going to have the efficiencies that we used to have, but we're staying alive. We're floating, right? If we don't do this and we start injecting more and more change into the environment, we're going to run more and more risk. Now you're kind of back into the IT operations on how do I mitigate change risk? And we're implementing new systems, we're bringing in more capabilities, we're introducing more risk to the environment. Maybe we introduce another vulnerability and we get popped again. We don't want to do that. So there is a balance and there has to be an understanding between people. Again, be as clear and as honest as you can be, right? If you've got critical um, ICS systems running that's producing your product, you want to make sure those are running. But if you have something that's calculating postage, it's one scale that somebody weighs and it tells the mail company, hey, charge us 54 cents for this stamp, put it on there. I really don't care about that system right now. I care about protecting the company. So that's kind of the conversation and it's kind of a come to Jesus close to heart. Like you have to understand we're in a terrible situation board and you know we were on the brink of being bankrupt. We're running now. You just gotta give this a, a little, right? We're all good. Any other questions, see me at the after party. Thank you, everyone.